Hello. I've been meaning to do this video for quite some time. Um, regular naggings from above. As the comedian Peter Kay says, if it's not one thing, it's your mother. Um, this is a presentation about the archaeological evidence and star law evidence of the great mother goddess of the Celts. Now, I'll just get the PowerPoint up and running. Takes me a little while to turn that on. So hopefully. Right. So this constellation here on the screen is a kind of W-shaped constellation on its side. And if you recognize it, it's the constellation of Cassiopeia, who was a, a queen in Greek mythology. But in Welsh mythology, in Welsh star lore, Cassiopeia, the constellation, was known as Chlis Don. And Don is the mother goddess of the Welsh gods and goddesses. You know, they're loosely known as the children of Don talking about the goddess Arianrod and the god Gwydion and others. And Don has an equivalent in Ireland, the goddess Danu. You know, and the uh, Irish gods and goddesses are the Duatha de Danan, the, the tribe of the goddess Dana or the children of Dana. So Chlis Don is the court of the mother goddess or well, the constellation Cassiopeia is, belongs to the mother goddess in Welsh tradition. So what can we learn from the constellation Cassiopeia? Well, on its side, it represented to many ancient cultures a throne. We look at it, you know, and traditionally the Greek queen that it's named for is depicted in the heavens sitting on the throne there's a couple of pictures of Cassiopeia no? and another one so this symbol of this heavenly throne for the queen of the heavens is very important and it's a recurring thing now <clears throat> not just in Greek mythology, but quite importantly in uh, Egyptian mythology. So here you can see Isis holding her baby Horus, but she's sitting on her throne. And actually the name Isis means throne, and she's usually depicted with the throne on her headdress. You know, so she's she wears the throne on her head, and her name, Isis, means throne, and it's all because she's the queen of the heavens. You know, another picture of Isis sitting on her throne, holding her baby. Looks a lot like the Virgin Mary and Jesus, but it's older, of course. You know, the heavenly mother and her child. Now, <clears throat> the goddess sitting on her throne is also to be found in the Celtic world. Now this figurine here is Dea Matrona from Gaul. So she's Romano-Celtic, again, sitting in a throne, holding a baby. And there's also this wonderful primitive looking goddess sitting on a throne. And she's from South Wales, from the Roman settlement at Perwent near Chepstow, you know? So she, this goddess on her throne, was there in Wales in Roman times, thousands of years before the North Welsh tradition said that Cassiopeia, the heavenly throne, belonged to Don, the mother goddess. It's a continuation. <clears throat> now, Looking at the stars then, there's going to be a fair bit of star law in this presentation, but I'll try and keep it simple. 
So the pale blue streak running up this screen is the Milky Way. And the darker blue is outer space, of course. But you'll see that Cassiopeia is on the Milky Way itself. You know, and that's quite important. Now, this main picture shows you the circumpolar stars. These are the stars that do not ever set. Other stars come and go depending on the winter and the summertime. But the circumpolar stars are always present. So there's Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. That's the big bear and the little bear. And between them, there's this dragon, Draco. So you've got two bears and a dragon, but they're not on the Milky Way. You know, only Cassiopeia is on the Milky Way. And the Milky Way was very important because it was the river of souls. It was the path to the spirit world and all that, you know. So she's actually sitting there on the spirit path or spirit work road herself. We'll come back to this star law shortly. <clears throat> now, Here's another Celtic artifact from Gaul. And look at it. Um, it's Dea Arteu, the, the bear goddess, but it's a goddess sitting on a throne and there's a great bear. No, Ursa Major and the goddess on the throne. So it's not just a bear goddess, it's star law, you know, and it could, agrees with other Celtic star law. So here's that map extended a little bit. So you can see the Milky Way running up the picture. <clears throat> and we're going to look at the star clusters at the bottom and at the top. But mainly right now, we just want to talk about the Milky Way and another way of looking at the constellation Cassiopeia. So on the one hand, it can be the heavenly throne. But it seems that the northern Celts turned it on its side and it represented breasts, heavenly boobies, you know, the boobs of the mother goddess, milk giving, you know, the, the old Latin name for the Milky Way is the Via Lactea. It was the, the Milky Way and the milk comes from those heavenly breasts. Now, on the Gunderstrup cauldron, uh, there's a rather lovely female figure representing the W shape of Cassiopeia on its side. So with her arm, she's making the shape of Cassiopeia. And there's some evidence to suggest that her hair represents the Milky Way symbolically as well. But here she is on the Gunderstrup cauldron. You know, and it's not unique to the Gunderstrup cauldron, cauldron. This crossing of arms to make the breast shape um, is also to be found on a small plaque that was found in Britain in Bath, Aquasulis. And archaeologists call it the Three Mothers, but the central figure is, you know, making the same breast shape or W shape with her arms. So it seems to be a recurring motif, this idea that Cassiopeia is also the heavenly boobies as well as the throne of the queen of heaven. So back to this map then. <clears throat> if we look at the top, there's a cluster of constellations and that's called the Summer Triangle. It's formed by three bright stars. You've got Deneb in Cygnus the Swan, and there's uh, a star in Aquila the Eagle and Vega in Lyra the Harp. And they were seen as three birds, these constellations. And at the bottom of the picture, there's a hexagon shape, which I'll come to. So the triangle at the top of the three birds are the summer stars. And the hexagon at the bottom are the winter stars. The hexagon is in the night sky during the winter months. And the triangle of birds is in the night sky during the summer months. So those constellations come and go as the, as the year turns, as the seasons turn. 
But Cassiopeia, the Queen of Heaven, is on the Milky Way, constantly above us. She never disappears. She's there all the time, whereas the winter stars and summer stars come and go. So here's a close up of the summer triangle, the three birds. Altar. Altair is the bright star of Aquila. I couldn't remember a minute ago. Anyway, these three birds are well attested in mythology, if you know your star law. They're depicted here on the church entrance in Somerset. This is the church of Stokes of Hampton near Montacute. But the three birds are there in the tree. The tree represents the axis of the the axis pole to the pole star and the three birds sitting on that tree around them are the three fire signs you can see on the left it says sagittarius sagittarius the centaur the archer and on the right is leo the lion and then above leo is an agnus die but it represents aries so it's the three fire signs that in the night sky form a triangle and inside that fire sign triangle are the three birds you know curiously the three fire signs also represent the three cauldrons aries is the head leo's the heart sagittarius is the thighs the powerhouse of the lower cauldron but the three birds summer triangle in welsh mythology the three birds are known as the Adar Rhiannon, the three birds of Rhiannon, and they're magical, they're otherworldly because they're in the heavens, you know, and she's a goddess. And in the story of Bran, Bran the Blessed, at the end of the story, he's a giant and he has his head decapitated and his head has to be carried by seven companions to London for his head to be buried at the Tower of London. But on their way to London, they stop for seven years at Harlech and they're entertained by the birds of Rhiannon. And what's that mean? You know, what that actually means poetically, symbolically, metaphorically, is that the three birds of Rhiannon singing to them for seven years meant that they somehow spent seven years in the summer land you know outside of reality they were just in the paradise realm for seven years before they continued on their journey and that seven years in the summer realm is quite important it relates to taliesin he was one of the seven companions here i'll come back to that so the winter stars are this hexagon and there's i won't name all the stars it takes too long but there's six constellations there's orion the hunter there's taurus the bull there's origa the chariot there's the gemini twins and there's canis minor and canis major the big dog and the little dog you know and they're on the milky way in the winter time you know i mean they're the, they're the winter stars simplistically um, you can think of them as the hunter and his hound. The dominant constellations, if you like, are Orion, the hunter, and Canis Major. And that's been quite universal in Northern Europe as just the winter hunter and his hound. Um, and there's plenty of lore about the winter hunt, the wild hunt, Gwynedd Neath, um, Hearn the hunter, even Odin doing the wild hunt, you know, this is a recurring Northern European star law story because the winter months, the night sky of the winter months tells that story of the winter hunting. You know, it's there in those constellations. So here's the amazing wow moment if you like then i want you to look at this map again so the queen of the heavens is in the middle cassiopeia on the milky way and she's ever present she's always there and above her are the three birds of the summertime 
and below her is the hunter and hound of the winter hunt, the wild hunt. So as the seasonal stars come and go, when the summer triangle, when the three birds are in the night sky in the summertime, the winter hunter is below the horizon, out of sight. You know, it's below the horizon in the other world or underworld. And vice versa. In the winter time, the winter hunter is in the night sky and the three birds are below the horizon and out of sight. And that changes just like a turning of a clock, you know from winter to summer, winter to summer, and so on. But here's the magic thing then on the Gunderstrup cauldron, on another panel, the same goddess figure that made a W shape with her arms is depicted holding a bird in her hand with two other big birds above her head. Now look at this. Her upraised hand has a tiny little bird upon it. That would be Vega. Um, on the constellation Lyra. And then on either side of her head are two big birds, you know, so that would correspond with Cygnus the Swan and Aquila the Eagle. So she's the goddess on the Milky Way and above her are the three birds. And if the three birds are in the sky, then the hunter and hound are below the horizon. Now look below her breasts, falling upside down, descending into the other world is an upside down dog and a man. The hunter and hound are falling. They're below the horizon. That's amazing. This is ancient star law on the Gunderstrup cauldron, showing that the northern Celts observed asterisms like the summer triangle and the winter hexagon. So, there were many different mother goddesses, of course, you know, because there were many different Celtic tribes. So this drawing is of a Romano-Celtic plaque that was found in Gloucestershire in England, in Britain, in England. And it represents the goddess Rosmerta. She's in, accompanied by Mercury. But Rosmerta, her name means, and she's not just in Gloucestershire, she's all over Europe. Her name means the great provider or distributor, great provider, giver of all that is needed. And in the middle of the plaque, in her own right hand, she's holding a ladle above a bucket. Now, <laughs> it's an interesting symbolism. Now, there's this wonderful phenomena, of course, that as planet Earth spins on its axis, it creates this stirring of the stars, you know? So what is stirring the stars? Of course, you know, um, in America, they call the great bear, the big dipper, and also known as the plow, you know, but that big dipper means a big ladle. So just as we saw the, throned goddess next to a great big bear the goddess the mother goddess in the center is also next to the big bear as the big dipper so you've got this goddess figure and a great big ladle stirring stirring the night sky the the stirring of the cosmic milk you know from the milky way brings to mind of course the story of Keridwen and her cauldron that had to be stirred for a year and a day. The whole mythology of Keridwen's cauldron from the Haynes Taliesin is a star law story. Too complicated to go into right now. But Guion back before he turns into Taliesin has to stir this cauldron for a whole year and a day, just like Rosmerta with her ladle and her bucket you know, which is Romano-Celtic times, Keridwen and Taliesin are from late medieval stories, you know, but it's the same symbolism of this great mother goddess. And Keridwen is a mother. She has a beautiful daughter and an ugly son that she's trying to brew a potion for. And after the animal shape-shifting chase, she consumes Guion back as a grain of wheat. 
carries him inside her for nine months and then gives birth to him at Beltane. So, of course, she's a cosmic mother with this cauldron that needs stirring, just like Rosmerta and her bucket and ladle. The Keridwin stuff um, is from the late Welsh bardic tradition, of, of which the figurehead is Taliesin himself, of course. Now, his poems are often obscure, but there's lots of gems in the lines of his poems. And these following lines are from the Haynes Taliesin in the Mabinogion of Lady Charlotte Guest. <coughs> primary chief bard of Elfim, and my original country is the region of the summer stars. The summer stars are the three birds of Rhiannon, where he spent seven years with Bran, Bran's head, you know, seven years listening to the birds of Rhiannon. And then further on, he says, I know the name of the stars from north to south. Now you can think of that as a summer triangle in the winter hexagon. And I have been on the galaxy at the throne of the distributor. And Rosmerta means great provider or distributor. Amazing. You know, it's there in the Taliesin poems, which are late medieval singing the same song that we see in the little little figurines from Romano-Celtic times, you know, that's a gap of over a thousand years. In Northern Britain, which was Taliesin's territory too, he was barred to Wayne up Reged, the son of Urians up Reged, the Lake District area. In the north there, the Briganti tribe and their main goddess was Brigantia. You know, she's a Brythonic version of Brigid in Ireland. Um, both Brigid, Bridey and Brigantia mean the high one. Now, this figurine of Brigantia is very Romanized, made to look a lot like Minerva with a helmet and shield and spear and so on. But there's hidden symbolism in that. But down by her feet, on the left-hand side, there's a strange stone, and this is called an omphalos, and it represents the center stone or egg stone or navel, center point of a sacred ground or a territory. But it simply just represents the center of everything, the center point, you know? And of course, the center point of the Milky Way in the circumpolar stars is Cassiopeia. It's the center point, you know. Elsewhere in northern Britain, uh, Brigantia is described as celestial. Celestial means of the stars. So she's of the stars. She's the most high. And her symbol is the center point stone, center of the night sky. So this icon that I illustrated kind of combines all of these ideas, if you like, of the circumpolar stars. So at the bottom is the statue of Brigantia that we just saw. But then the rest of the image relates to the circumpolar stars. There's the mother bear and the baby bear, right bear and little bear. And between them is Bridget's spear, which represents with the red serpent going up, it represents the constellation of Draco the dragon. So there's the two bears and the dragon. And on Bridget herself, on her breasts, I've put a W-shape ornament to represent the heavenly boobies or the throne of the Queen of Heaven, you know. And even on her shield, I've put three swans to represent the Adarianan or the three birds of the summer triangle. So anyway, hope you enjoyed that some insights to the Celtic mother goddess and the importance of the constellation of the mother goddess that never sets. It never, it's there all year round, always above us, always up above the center of the grove. Now, 
Celtic star law insights and Bardic use of star law for mystery teachings are a big part of this book of mine. It's over 700 pages. It's available on Amazon. Um, Gwyn, God of Anun, Druidic star law and the Bardic mysteries. So if you enjoyed what you've seen, please check out, check out my book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I give thanks to the mother of all things, from whom all things are born into being and to whom all things will return. Oh, 